seated ma magnificently on a rearing bronze cast horse. Sophie towered over us. This work was surrounded by a small group of people, all arms folded, each wearing a version of my mother's expression on their faces, all quiet, all white. <laughs> We didn't discuss this outing much thereafter, and I didn't think about Sophie again, um, again for much later, four years to be precise. A few months into my second year, I found myself sitting in Charlene's, Charlene Kahn's class, um, feeling that same way. Arms folded, lips pursed, and a crease between my eyebrows. Quiet. The lecture series was titled, Talking Back, Black Feminist Creative Methodologies and we were covering Sabande's Sophie again. Sophie, unlike the contorted sculptures and abstract paintings I was accustomed to, was so much more than just an art object. Sophie's presence alone affected her audience. In this particular case, a white audience. Although I cannot speak for my mother or the people I stood alongside in that gallery, um, I could see that she made them feel something. It was written in their faces, in their body language, and in their silence. She made me feel something, something unusual. She made me feel uncomfortable. I stood before this magnificent, empowered woman, and I felt uncomfortable. Why? Why would this figure, a figure of the domestic worker, a figure I'm so familiar with, cause me to feel discomfort? Sabane actively chooses to describe Sophie using her more laden term, maid, as opposed to the politically correct term, domestic worker. The word maid is loaded. It points not only to an occupation, but a violence. For entrenched in this occupation is the degrading social structures of apartheid. To be a maid in South Africa is not simply an occupation, it is an identity, a performativity. In her book, Black Feminist Thought, African-American social theorist Patricia Hill Collins ties the image of the maid to the controlling image of the mammy figure. To quote Collins, she is the faithful, warm, motherly, obedient domestic slave. The mammy, in essence, becomes the ideal metaphysical relationship between black women and that of white heteronormative power. My experience with the South African mammy is not an isolated one. A gumtree.com advert quite aptly illustrates this uncomfortable dynamic that marks the mammification of the domestic worker in, in, in middle class South African homes. Situated under an advertisement for a used lawn mower lies the entry looking for domestic worker. The description reads, live in domestic worker required, must be good with kids, clean and tidy, be able to speak English. English spelled with a lowercase e. <laughs> Needs someone honest and trustworthy. Must be able to live in and go home every two months. This position is full time, so please don't respond unless you understand the requirements. Above which is a very stereotypical image of a black woman in blue overalls, smiling while ironing a shirt. Similarly, another advert reads, Martha is a 31-year-old Malawian woman and has been working for us for the last year, and we immediately welcomed her to the family. She is punctual, hardworking, and trustworthy, and has proved to be an asset in our household. But we've recently had our first child and have employed a specialist nanny, so there is no longer a need for Martha in the house. She is looking to start a new job ASAP. The South African domestic worker is mammified. Her identity is defined by her occupation. She becomes something to be traded, discarded, or mistreated as her employer chooses. She becomes an object whereby one's reality is defined by others, one's identity created by others, to quote Bell Hooks. Having grown up in the very privileged setting of a middle-class white family in the predominantly white neighborhood of Four Ways in Johannesburg, South Africa, the figure of the mammy was and is still very prominent in my life. I was taught that her name is Lucy. She wears blue or pink overalls, a white apron, and a duk every day to work. She speaks Zulu, 
She's kind and quiet, and I grew up loving Lucy as a mother. When I saw Sophie for the first time, I was confronted by this image. Seeing Sophie made me feel uncomfortable. Seeing Sophie made me look retrospectively at my relationship with Lucy, and the dynamic <coughs> becomes uneasy. It became uncomfortable. After this particular lecture, I phoned Lucy and I asked her questions about her life, questions I had never bothered to ask before. Why was I uncomfortable? Well, the answer is quite simple. Her name's not Lucy, but rather Tokumotlala. Her family live in Cornelia in the Free State Province, and she does not speak Zulu. She speaks Northern Sutu. What I was feeling was not only discomfort, it was guilt. Mm. Tokumot Lala performed the role of quiet and subservient Lucy while she worked as a domestic worker in my home for the past 20 years. Lucy's identity is very literally defined for her. She is silenced by the definition placed on her by white heteronormative power. At this point though, it's imperative for me to note that to define Lucy by her struggle would be another violence in itself. Pumla Gola <laughs> argues that black women are characterized as those who carry six mountains on their back. <coughs> those who are burdened by a history of interlocking oppressions. This does not mean that she is defined by her struggle. It means that she is still surviving. For although she is burdened, she is able to move with them. I cannot speak for Lucy. She speaks for herself, and just like Sophie, She's anything but quiet. She was loud in the way she worked, slowly and heavily, how she sighed and how she clicked her tongue. It isn't a matter of whether she has been speaking. She has always been speaking. The question becomes, was I listening? And more than that, when I do, how do I behave thereafter? I interviewed Lucy earlier this year in preparation for this paper. And in respecting her wishes, I have not transcribed it. I asked if, if I should refer to her as Toko or Lucy in this paper. Her response was powerful and sticks with me every day. She said that I did not know Toko and that I only knew Lucy. She said that when I knew her, genuinely knew her, when I can speak to her in her language, only then do I get to call her by her Sutu name. Mm -hmm. I am not here speaking about my encounters with racism and privilege in a vacuum. We exist in the teeth of a system entrenched in inequality, to quote Audre Lorde. White heteronormativity does not want women, particularly white women, responding to racism. It wants racism to be accepted as a given, as ordinary, like tea time or the common cold. Having grown up in this white suburbia, tea time or the dinner table are also concepts I'm very familiar with. Sarah Ahmed, British scholar and feminist Killjoy, likens the dinner table gathering to that of the system. At the dinner table, there are unspoken strict rules of moral conduct that each person must follow so as to behave properly. We must sit in our assigned places, be quiet, sit up straight, have polite conversations, we must keep the occasion happy. To break the rules is to upset the table of happiness, to cause trouble. A response to my, to my question of how do I behave thereafter could be found in Samantha Weiss's paper, How Do I Live in this Strange Place? Weiss, a white South African philosophy professor at Bits University, posits the question of what is the morally appropriate reaction to one's situation of privilege. Her answer being, if we are a problem, we should perhaps concentrate on recovering and rehabilitating ourselves. A personal, inward-directed project, she suggests, should be cultivated in silence. Mm. For Vice, the process stops at guilt. That we feel discomfort in the form of guilt. Recognize the reason as to why we feel guilty and remain silent. For Vice, these habits of whiteness are disrupted once I come to the realization that my whiteness has harmed others. <coughs> and to remain silent thereafter is the morally ethical way forward. According to Vice, my voice in the public sphere will inevitably be tainted by the harmful features of what she calls whiteliness. 
in that acting further, I cause more harm. Being silent, according to Vice, is the ethical refusal to be fully defined by what is worst about me. I sat in Charlene's Doing It For Daddy symposium last year, and I was exactly that, silent. The topic of white silence had surfaced, and one of the presenters said while looking directly at me, I find this completely redundant that we are speaking of white silence now in this space when I can see three examples of it sitting in front of me. I was one of three white women in the room. I remember the situation like it was yesterday. I became filled with fury, and yet I remained silent because I didn't want to cause trouble. Mm -hmm. We are not supposed to feel our emotions in public, and most certainly not at the table, but we feel them um, anyway. Emotions are inevitable. Judith Butler defines trouble as something that one should never do precisely because that would get one in trouble. The prevailing law threatened one with trouble, even put one in trouble, all to keep one out of trouble. Trouble is inevitable. To stand quietly with my lips pursed, arms folded and a crease between my eyebrows is not enough. The table is supposed to be quiet. If trouble is inevitable, then what is it that I'm afraid of? And so you see, that day in the gallery, in Charlene's class, at the symposium, and even now as I sit before you, it's not only guilt that I'm feeling, but what I see, when I see something as beautiful as Sophie, makes me feel anything less than proud, then there is something wrong. To feel discomfort in the presence of Sophie is a very sad reality of so many white bodies in this country. And so, that day in the gallery, yes, I was feeling discomfort, I was feeling guilty, but I was also angry. Angry with myself, my family, and the people that stood alongside me, arms folded, lips pursed, and a crease between the eyebrows. All of us were quiet, and what did that achieve? What does the, si the silent self-reflexivity do for those who have been harmed by whiteness? To quote Audre Lorde, guilt is not a response to anger, it is a response to one's own act actions or lack of actions. If it leads to change, then it can be useful. It's easy to walk out of that space and not question my discomfort at all. Who would know the difference? It is easy to feel guilty. It is easy to be silent. Sophie defines the borders of the table. She is everything that white heteronormativity is not. She is affective and she is troublesome. She sparks change in both those who have been silenced as well as those who have been doing the silencing. Just by being, she upsets the table. There is a time to be silent, a time to listen and let others speak. <coughs> but when we choose to be silent when we can cause change, we accept our places at the table. We preserve a space that breeds hatred and stagnation. I'm not afraid of anger, for I know that its object is change. I, for one, am angry and I'm done being silent. And I plan on using my voice to support a, bro a broader social justice. I recognize that the struggle for justice is larger than any one group, individual, or social movement. Social justice is a collective problem that requires a collective solution. And when it comes to this story, the only thing that is essential to me is that it contributes toward this end. Women like Lucy, Mary Sabande, Audre Lorde claim the place of affectivity. They inspire a willingness to survive, a willfulness to kill the happiness that makes these problems seem inevitable. For if we will not fight our assigned seats at the table, then we must acknowledge our own accountability, that we are no better than the people that we sit with, and that being silent, we too are doing the silencing. And so, in the words of Yvette Abram, it is not enough to be against oppression. We need to decide what we are for. What am I for? To tell this story. Okay. So we have a VGA cable, we just have to install it. Can we do that? And then uh, we're going to next have Beverly Barry. Uh, Beverly is a uh, master's student in art history, and uh, her research is around uh, 
is around the San and Khoi uh, and Khoi San heritage, particularly visual representation and rethinking the kinds of knowledges that that have uh, become authorized knowledges around uh, uh, San and Khoi Khoi uh, visual representations. I'm, I'm going to start. Um, the, the presentation I'm doing today is, is just about having an African feminist conversation about the representation of San and Khoi Khoi in rock art. I need to say that it's very new. It's not like I've been doing it for years. I'm not an art institute student, so it's, it's an exploratory process, and I'm very excited to examine the colonial histories, to find those silent histories that are sleeping, <coughs> but not necessarily dead. And in this instance, I am following Abrams as well, um, because I think that the, the part that is, that is fascinating me is to learn how to read between the lines mm -hmm. and how to see through people. And, and an example is when we are children and you look at adults, like you were speaking about, you can actually see through adults. You can see how the system works and you can see how things are. So that's, what, that's the kind of practice which, which I'm, I'm going to be thinking about. Also, I'm not quite sure whether I'm on the feminist, whether I'm on the womanist, whether I'm following um, Oyemuye's concepts of the invention of women to make African sense whether I'm making indigenous sense, but I am thinking of myself as a scholar, I'm thinking of myself as an activist, and I'm mm. thinking of myself as an entry-level elder. Mm. Not quite <laughs> <laughs> So what that means is that part of my role in as a scholar, but also in society, is to, to and I'm going to be quoting you extensively now, uh, Yvette, is to find that cultural shorthand. And we know that when we're in our cultural setting with our home and families, there are certain signals that happen, and we know what that is. And as an elder, I find that young people, for older and young people, we need to start to say these things so that young children, when they hear it and they experience it, they can actually trust their intuition. So that's what I want to look at. And I also want to look at the double meanings and, and, and reconsidering my own historical and cultural learnings. Because at my age, I think I'm probably one of the best colonized scholars in the world. <laughs> you know, in terms of my thinking, in terms of my education, and in terms of what I have been taught with. So, and what I have found in this reading is that the association of San and Kui Kui to colored is a very difficult mm. thing. Mm. It's not something that you jump into and say, oh, I'm, I'm San and Koi Koi, because if you look at me, it's like a total contradiction. So, but I'm, I want to be looking at what is this political identity? Where do we come from? And how do I make sense of the colonial racial matrix mm. of power where one's entire being is racialized and people speak to you and look at you and act towards you in terms of your color, in terms of your culture, and in terms of your background. So, and I'm following in that area, I'm kind of looking at Walter Mignolo's work, and, and I find it quite um, inspirational. Wow. So indigenous people's history, as Charlene said, is located in the authorized knowledge systems of mainly anthropology and, and of course, history. And when you think of the rock art, you know that we have the, it's the coat of arms, we have the coat of arms, mm -hmm. and you have those two black figures, mm -hmm. and that is in fact how rock art is drawn. You don't see the images of what rock art is all about, you actually see the redrawn depictions of, of what it is. Don't you do me a favor and just uh, uh, find the, the white lady of Brandberg images, and then we'll just come up. If you just say <coughs> Because <laughs> I think while I talk, um, yeah. So, so the depiction of the coat of arms is the white lady of Brandenburg. <laughs> the, the indigenous book. So the the coat of arms has the slogan "Diverse people unite." But what it is, in fact, is the visit. The, the 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 slogan, in fact omits the visibility of the very people that they intend to acknowledge. Because if you look at us, we are not figures. The, the, and you'll see there, the sand art and the rock art is not 
it's not figures. These are, this is what has been drawn, but that is in fact how it looks. So what fascinates me when you look at it is that there's an entire background of, 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 of rock art. I mean, as an artist, one of the important things is your canvas. Mm -hmm. And Kate, where's Kate? Kate, you have to prime it and you have to stretch it and you have to do all kinds of things. But when rock art is depicted, there is no canvas. Mm -hmm. It is just a white sheet of paper. So, so that's what I'm thinking about. So I found this quote where somebody said, uh, Mawal Jarlai. This is his response to rock art. He says, somebody told me recently that rock art is dead. And if rock art was dead, that would not matter to we, we Aborigines. We have never thought of our rock art paintings as art. To us, they are images, images with energies that keep us alive. Every person, everything we stand on hmm. and are made from and eat and live on. I'll read it again. Somebody told me just recently that rock art is dead. If art was dead, that would not matter to you Aborigines. We have never thought of our rock paintings as art. To us, they are images. Images with energies that keep us alive. Every person, everything we stand on, are made from, eat and live on. In this quote, Maul Jari is told the news about the demise of rock art, its state of not being alive, of not being here in the life of the now and the future, of not existing, of not being able to communicate with, not being seen and experienced. He does not respond or react to the representation of rock art's position, its state of being, or its status, because this <coughs> representation comes from the, or the a colonial authority or mandate to act on behalf of or for the indigenous people by recreating and representing their life their culture and their art. Rock art thus becomes a misnomer and it is wrongly named within the context of images and energies that nurture the aliveness of life. As an alternative to the to representation, the paper follows the works of Mignolo to posit the idea of re-presenting as a decolonial enunciation which delineates the repeated presentation of indigenous visual art and culture through creative crea uh, theorization, practices and productions by indigenous people. Mahal Jalri, as an indigenous person, depositions rock art out of the context of a sovereign colonial death by enunciating the essence and the nature of rock art, that it may remains alive with energies that rejuvenates life for everything, that is for all living nature. He talks back in an alternative way by not responding or reacting, by refusing to entertain the this, this statement that rock art is dead. And he does this, he does, he does not have a response, he does not, he does not give a, posi he does a, a position with a reposition or the thesis with an antithesis. The enunciation may, may have been activated by the statement, but it was not born from the same stum or wortel as we'd say, or the root. <laughs> The enunciation exists with or without the statement. So there is no matter to locate art within the historical colonial art death. Mawal Jal, uh, I keep getting his name wrong, Mawal Jar Lai's proposal causes rock art to become a visual, cultural, and historical contested site, shifting from the colonial aesthetic episteme, which philosophizes about art but which is now both a cultural and creative industry. His sense of rock art as images and of energies of <coughs> sensory impression of interconnectedness echoes Mignolo's decolonial as thesis that opens up the plural pl plurality of ways to relate to the world of the sensible that has been silenced. The decolonializing aesthetic is about the world to imagine and create beyond the logic of coloniality. Mm. which places rock art in the prehistoric time, mm. the pre-colonial time, mm. the time when art was about human beings putting marks on services, mm. on surfaces, according to Danto in his article 
after the end of art, contemporary art and the pale of history. In South Africa, the rock figures are counted, redrawn, associated to trans dance dances and represented as the original work utilized to understand cultural rituals, practices, as well as the lifestyle of the sand and the coin. Rock art is named and it is sold by people who own the land. In the vicinity of Grahamstown, if you want to go to rock art, you have to pay for it. It is owned by people with farms, so it has a market value where the copyrights are shared amongst government, universities, and international foundations, one of which is in Geneva, uh, to feed the novelty demand of four indigenous art collectors. The colonialization of rock art operates <coughs> in the matrix of power where the, center, where the settler is centered and he or she have appropriated the powers to make suppositions about what is rock art, which in this case, the position that I'm taking, is actually off the center, where there is no insider and outsider because the lines are blurred. In the time, one of the studies that I will, doing, will be doing is about the sand in Platfontein. And even though they are located in Platfontein, they are not from South Africa. They are from Namibia, they are from Angola, and so you have a movement of people across the time. It's not just South African. This is what Tuck and Yang refer to as decolonialization by decentering and de-linking from the very foundations of the Western concepts and the accumulation of knowledge, that is the geo and the body politics of knowledge from its foundation. Uyemi Uyeyume, when you know mm -hmm. she can't speak, talks about shifting from the world view to the world sense, from one view to the whole sense of energies. The rock art I want to talk about today is called the White Lady of Bradbury. <laughs> okay. It's an interesting one. It's situated in Namibia. It's located uh, 70 miles from um, Cape Cross with the Portuguese anchored in 1485. And I'm only going to be talking about one text, which, was, uh, which studied the, the rock art from 1929 to 1948, which is when apartheid started. And you'll see that it has been photographed. These are some of the images. But in all the, the images of the, of, the, of the white lady, you'll see that it has been redrawn and drawn over and over and over again so that they can prove that she's a white lady, a Mediterranean woman. And, the, the, the <laughs> and, and besides the fact that they count how many animals are there. Now, one of the fascinating things about the koi koi and the sand, when the settlers came, and there's a lot of things we don't know about, but for me it's been quite fascinating, is that when the settlers were passing through and they were irritated by the settlers, <coughs> each animal had a name. All they had to do was whistle and that entire herd would move. Have you ever heard of that? We have schools where our dogs go to now, eh? you will train them. <laughs> that is all they did. They whistled and the entire herd would move. Even if they had exchanged it and bartered it, if they made them angry, they would just move. So for me, there's the, the, there's the, the, the text of, of, of rock art is, is like an empirical scientific study, except that, and it's about curiosity and appropriation of her face, of her color, uh, of, of, of the adornments that she wears. And so they kidnap her out of the African context and they place her in their context. Goddesses of Diana, they likened her to the Greek god of Diana, which is the goddess of the hunt, of the moon and of birth. They've also likened her to Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, because of course she's color, you know, and the messenger and the sea and the sky. So naming is a form of ownership which dislocates her from the context of the savage and the primitive into the realm of the colonizer. This is what Tuck and Yang call the move to innocence in their paper, where decolonization is not a metaphor, which inversely means that colonization is a metaphor. And it is a representation. In this way, they dislodge it from the indigenous people's context while simultaneously locating themselves in the indigenous narrative. She is the one of us 
and we are the one of them, what Robert Langton calls in his book of the anthropology of art, the European indigenous. Have you heard of that? women in Botswana is that young girls exercise the will to decide whether they are women ready enough to be married, to have partnership, to have children and to form a family. In Hu, Nisa's family, a man came and approached her and she took days. She went out and she came back and she thought about whether in fact this is what she wants to do. Her willfulness of self-determination is centered in her own sense of readiness. And one historical text of which I, I have a clip, but I don't have the reference, is, is where women had the opportunity to make fun of men when they were being arrogant or when they were not being humbled, which we call they not, you, you must pluck you. You have to be humble. So if you're not being humbled, then they, can, they, 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 they would make fun of you. And then there's also a story of Valiant, who is attracted to a young Quaker woman, and this is what he says. Her person was slender and elegant, and her shape formed to inspire love. She was the youngest of graces under the figure of a Hottentot. One would suspect that the settlers would have been attracted to the unusual beauty of women and completely dismayed by their nakedness 
which have been would have been construed as pon pornography from the world view of the European sensibility where sexuality was the due was taboo and one would have only been able to see a naked body had you been an artist one has to read between the lines to ascertain the creativity that went in to the styling of the hair the adornments of the body which then might have been strange and extravagant but today it's very much part of the art history of fashion to have to be making your earrings out of of natural uh, things like eggshells or ostrich shells it's 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 considered an apothecary i'm almost done i'd like to also investigate the concept of parody and humor where she may have been making fun of the settlers performing or mimicking their culture and their language parading their clothes and their wares painting the white mask on a black mask on black face and giving the impression rather than representing the becoming without the becoming students and in our department and that we get to uh, hear them give such fantastic presentations. Uh, next up is Amy von Witt and she is a fourth year student in, BS in, in the department. She's doing a BSA. <laughs> good morning. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> <coughs> Many of the injustices in the world today can be traced back to colonialism, to the West's oppressive political and cultural assertion of metropolitan dominance of center over margin. This paper aims to draw attention to the ways in which artists working in a post-colonial positionality highlight the injustices created by Western domination and open up critical dialogues around such topics. The term post-colonial, as used here, covers all the culture affected by the imperial process from the moment of colonization to the present day. This paper will discuss the work of artists Buhlebeza Siwani, Ayana B. Jackson, and Kanisi Lembongwa. I have chosen to speak about these artists because I feel that their work is relevant and pushes boundaries in ways that serve to open up critical dialogues around pertinent issues. I am in no way trying to speak for the artists, and I acknowledge my position as a white woman speaking about the art of women of color. However, I would rather be speaking about their work than that of white artists who have been represented in the arts <coughs> for centuries. Drawing on discourse from post-colonial theorists, artists, and art historians, this paper seeks to illustrate some of the ways in which those that have historically been left out of the canon of art create meaningful work that refuses to be silent. It responds to the fact that the weight of antiquity continues to dominate cultural production in much of the post-colonial world. And that the contemporary culture, and that contemporary culture exploits notions of otherness with both visual images and text. This paper will focus on identity in relation to history, with identities being, according to Stuart Hall, the names we give to the different ways in which we are positioned by and position ourselves within the narratives of the past. It will also touch on the pleasure-driven commodification of otherness embedded in mainstream art and visual culture, and the erasure of history that enables that enjoyment. As critical black feminist theorist Bell Hooks explains, currently, 
the commodification of difference promotes paradigms of exchange by a consumer cannibalism that not only displaces the other, but denies the significance of that other's history <coughs> through a process of recontextualization. How then do we deal with this problem? Ashcroft, Griffiths, and Tiffin offer that it is through the arts that the day-to-day -day realities experienced by colonized peoples have been most powerfully encoded and so profoundly influential. <coughs> One such example is the art of South African artist and Isangoma, Utlebezo Siwani, who works across different <coughs> visual art mediums, including performance, photography, sculpture, and video. Her 2015 solo exhibition, Ingwawa Yetu Khakazi, excuse my pronunciation, which loosely translates to the witch's baggage, explores themes of South African spirituality and healing, notions of Christianity, and positions the black female body in the center of the work, using her body and performance to look at ideas of purity and cleansing. In the video artwork entitled Ungezele Pansi, Siwani confronts the viewer in an honest and original way by plucking chicken feathers off her otherwise naked body. Writing about this work in particular, Chez Matakala asks us to consider for a moment that chickens are used in some traditional cleansing ceremonies during funerals. Siwani, as Isangoma, who cannot attend funerals, turns to Siwani as an artist to cleanse a body which is multidimensional. Siwani, cited in Matakala, further explains her work and the use of her own naked body. We are constantly costumed by how people see us. We are costumed by historical baggage. We are costumed by cultural baggage. We are costumed by patriarchy. So the only honest way for me to actually just return the days in a sense is by me taking everything I have put on off so that we can look at each other is basically about the many ways in which I was cleansed <coughs> and washed and how I feel about how I've grown up and my memories surrounding that regarding Christianity, colonization, being a black female body, history, culture, all of those things and the violence <coughs> around the black female body in these spaces. The art that Siwani creates is loaded with symbolism and memories that express her double consciousness and can relate to a number of South Africans and in this sense, her art opens up a pertinent rhetoric that is not found in mainstream Western art. Siwani further tackles Western power in her use of language in titling her work. She is multilingual and titles her artworks in Isikosa, providing no translation. This serves to elevate Isikosa and give it value, while til simultaneously undermining English and challenging its efficacy. I will now digress to look back briefly at the visual archive. Throughout centuries of white racial dominance, the media and by extension visual culture have been controlled by white people, with the result being that the black body has become <coughs> demonized and delegitimized. Within a racist context, it does not matter whether you do good or you do bad. The crux is that you can choose to do what you wish with the black body. <coughs> the appropriation of the black body in claim through archives is seen extensively in photography. Okui and Rizal speaks of dealing with the archive as, as a <coughs> signpost, pointing to how difference and otherness are constructed <coughs> through photographic presence, and how the black form is as much a grotesque bearer of traumatized experiences as it is the abject vessel of race mm -hmm. as a point of differentiation. David Nadali, cited in Hook, talks about the constructedness of memory. This is as relevant to the context of photography as it is to the context of post-apartheid fiction from which Madali speaks. War photographs, as well as anthropological photography, both form part of archives that present themselves as contestable truths. Susan Sontag states, pictures taken by photographers out in the field at the moment of or just before death are the most celebra celebrated and often reproduced of war photographs. Racism is inherent in the war photographs that are widely disseminated by the media. And the more remote or exotic the place, the more likely we are to have full frontal views of the dead and dying. This stems from the centuries old practice of exhibiting the exotic, that is colonized human beings. <coughs> Sontag goes on to point out the racist injustice created by the West. The other, even when not an enemy, is regarded only as someone to be seen and not someone like us who also sees. 
One of the reasons images of non-white people in pain and suffering are so widely circulated and celebrated is because of societal racism, which is driven by pleasure, joy, and triumphant emotions, as well as hate and hostility. The ethically ori aestheticizing of pain and art, pain through art and photography, stems from the power embedded in white racial dominance. Anthony Farley speaks of how power, in the form of racial categorization, is a form of pleasure. He further intimates, race is a form of pleasure in one's body, which is achieved through humiliation of the other, and then, as the last step, through a denial of the entire process. We deny it through a discourse in which race appears as a thing created by nature, <coughs> and not as a practice developed by a culture. Responding to the racist pleasure felt by some when seeing black bodies in pain, African-American photographer and filmmaker Ayanna B. Jackson engages with archives of North American slavery and lynching. By restaging old photographs of such traumatic events with the use of her own body, she draws attention to the aestheticization of pain and in so doing also critiques it. <coughs> Death 2011 and Diorama 2011 are examples that illustrate this. In Death, Jackson restages a lynching with her own body. The framing of the photograph is similar to that of photographs of lynchings that were sent <coughs> as postcards in America in the 19th century. In the background is a black and white mirrored scene of a lush, tranquil slave owner's estate. In stark contrast to this hangs the highly saturated <coughs> image of Jackson's limp and seemingly lifeless body, lit in such a way that her body appears flawless and desirable. This juxtaposition of death with desire leaves the viewer in a moral quandary. Similarly, in Diorama, in which Jackson takes on the role of both slave owner and her slaves, her naked body is again presented in a desirable light, which serves to raise questions about the experiences of black female slaves and leaves the viewer mourning their sexual agency. Some of Jackson's slaves return the viewer's gaze, challenging them to think critically about what they feel when viewing a photograph. The over aestheticization of her photographs is another technique that Jackson uses to critique mainstream white visual culture and the objectification and consumption of the black female body. Tani Sile Mbongwa is a South African performance artist who often confronts notions of whiteness in her work. Her recent performance piece at the 2017 National Arts Festival <coughs> held here in Grahamstown, entitled Umikelo Oshikiwe Ibanda Lomlindo which loosely translates to waiting blindly for a burnt offering, deals with Christian concepts of sacrifice, placing the black female body in the center of the work. Her artist's notes begin with a sacrifice, a cleansing, a purification. I have no bull, sheep, goat, or pigeons to offer as a sacrificial animal demanded by God. So I offer this black human body as the ultimate sacrifice for cleansing and purification that will appease whiteness. Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, was not enough. Now I am offering the selfless sacrifice. Within the historical context of the Christian religion, the black body has always been a site of contestation. Fanon writes, the world rejects me on the basis of color prejudice. Black is also rejected biblically with the story of Cush. The black female body is doubly subjugated. <coughs> The performance begins with Mbongwa seated center stage, clothed in a shiny black dress which flows onto the floor in a large pool of black silk. Reciting a monologue, she starts to get more and more angry, eventually rising up and taking off the skirt to reveal her body, now covered only by a see-through charcoal body net, her private parts hidden by sequin decals. She proceeds to stomp furiously around the room, emphasizing the mantra she is repeating, <coughs> that Jesus Christ died to save us all, and now we must go out and kill our brothers and sisters with the chinking of her Mbuni ankle bracelet. The neat central pathway of cake flour is disturbed by passionate dancing as she weaves her way between the pipe tubing and hanging, hanging above open Bibles. In this moment, Mbongwa is, in, is a shining example of Sarah Ahmed's feminist killjoy, boldly taking on the role of angry black women in order to invoke strong emotion in audience members. She rages and glares, her fingers wag and point to give maximum offense. This is her ferocious resistance to the double subjugation of the black female body by missionary-driven Christianity. Sacrifice, cleansing, and purification are needed. 
and it comes towards the end when all is revealed and the artist returns to the black African world of mysticism, healing and self. In an act of acceptance and healing, she then moves around the room, offering holy communion <coughs> to the audience members. The artist's notes explain that in the wake of sacrifice, cleansing and purification, there is waiting and mourning. We wait for liberation whilst we mourn those who went to exile. We wait for freedom while we mourn those who disappeared without a trace. And we wait and mourn the future all at once, being nostalgic about the unknown. After the performance, I went to browse some of the market stores at the Darcy Arch, and one of the storeholders informed me that I had some flour on my bum and that he would have dusted it off if his wife wasn't watching. This really drove the message home for me in serving to illustrate <coughs> the sense of entitlement that men think they have with regards to the bodies of women. To sum up, the examples discussed in this paper highlight how we all write and speak from a specific place and time, from a history and culture that is specific. From a post-colonial standpoint, it is clear that the artistic and cultural practices are largely influenced by Western domination and that there is a continuity of preoccupations throughout the historical process initiated by European imperial impression. Artists, particularly artists of color, cannot simply keep quiet when faced with a centuries-old practice of exhibiting exotic, that is, colonized human beings. I've chosen to discuss the work of three artists of color because not only have they been historically marginalized and left out of the canon of art, there are also far too many white artists that get unwarranted academic and popular culture coverage. Too often white artists turn to the black body as a means to express themselves, which in my view is highly problematic. And Weasel explains that the relationship of the white or black artist to the black body is indeed paradoxical. And the less anxiously repeated the image, the better the opportunity to find an ethical ground to use its index as a form of discursive address. Whiteness is such a fragile thing that it needs to be interrogated and pulled apart and demythologized, because as Georgia suggests, it is through the screaming pain of racism that white people get life. And this is something that desperately needs to change. As Mbembe explains, for memory to fulfill its function long after the truth and recon reconciliation paradigm has run out of steam, the demythologizing of certain versions of history must go hand in hand with the demythologizing of whiteness. It's often difficult to talk about these things in the presence of white people. The issue of whiteness needs to dis be discussed without white people getting defensive because white people's tears have become a way of shifting the focus from the slave's narrative and displacing it with metaphor. Akil Mbembe comments that South Africa is in a moment when multiple old and recent unresolved crises seem to be on the path toward a collision. The age of innocence and complacency is over. It is evident that practices of looking back at history through archives need to change, and white people need to stop trying to speak on behalf of black people. Intersectionality and representation is also very important, as the apartheid archive can be seen as a white male archive. Looking at those archives now is to be able to read what was glossed over, to introduce the black experience, the female experience. Furthermore, when looking at white representations of African identity, we must allow that positions of spectatorship be recognized, particularly in a racist society. As always conditioned by the economy of racialized interpreta interpretation as well as desire. It is true that we become alienated, out of line with an effective community, when we do not experience pleasure from prox proximity to objects that are attributed as being good. Thus, what is deemed enjoyable and pleasurable in society also needs to be reevaluated, and whites have to look critically at instances where they find pleasure in viewing black bodies in pain or suffering in order to change these mindsets. White artists need to do more than feel shame when engaging with colonial archives and not replicate painful histories in an effort to elicit unwarranted sympathy. It is also important to acknowledge the value of theory when it comes to cultural and artistic practices because as Beatrice Spivak reminds us, theory has become a kind of thing that's completely cut off from everything, but it is not in fact cut off. We, theorists, are the personal trainers in the gym of the mind. Further, artists and cultural practitioners have the ability to play a highly influential role in society, and this should not be taken for granted. In the tumultuous social environment we currently find ourselves in, it is vital that we use the skills and resources available 
to alleviate social injustices. And this includes letting those that have been historically silent, such as women of color, be heard. Thank you. Instead of just having the three presenters up there and interrogating them, that we can have a dialogue. Uh, it's a nice space for that. And so, um, if you do have any questions uh, for the for the different presenters, then please address it to them. But otherwise, we can just share our thoughts and comments uh, about the presentations and the issues raised. Uh, some of the things um, uh, I kind of want to raise uh, is. Um, the, issue, the issue of quietness, um, and of course, uh, some, some of my students go through Yvette Abrams' um, really, I don't, I don't know, the, I, I don't know the adjective uh, for what that work is, um, where she speaks about um, uh, Sarah Bachman as, as a remix, and that, that piece always takes all our breath away. Um, and we are, we struggle to speak here because so much is spoken. And so this, this issue of silence, being made silent versus silence about when you remain quiet, willingly in order to listen to others, because we can't always be talking at the same time. The dialogue requires someone to perform an act, a gesture of quietness in order to hear others versus uh, the rhetoric that I can't speak, I don't have a voice, I am made silent. Also quietness, this, the, this kind of fallacy that quietness is submissive, uh, that, there's a, that there's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, which I think most of us disagree with, I think. Um, also this issue of naming. Um, I, I was supposed to be on a panel of naming earlier this week, but I, I wasn't able to. Um, but this, this, this notion um, that white supremacy tells us, uh, like when we want to change Rose's name and we say, it's not really that important. <laughs> and, then, and then I say, okay, it's not important to you, it doesn't matter to you, <coughs> it matters to me, so why don't you change it? If it doesn't matter to you, right? <laughs> um, and then the kinds of namings we have to deal with, you know, maid versus domestic worker, uh, indigenous, this kind of the, the, the colonial dimensions of categorizing, right? Simon says, when I walk into a room, I am not a man, I am a new genus, I'm a new category. A man is named. But people of color become a category under which we are named. And so it's, 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 it's relevant to all of the, the speakers' uh, presentations. And, and how do we name? The importance of naming the names by which we call ourselves, the names by which we are called, the names which we internalize, the names which we externalize. And, and black feminist and race theory has given us so much work on why naming is important. And then we sit at Rhodes University this week having a debate about, should we change the name from a homicidal, genocidal maniac to something we all want, want to identify with? that we have to debate that in July 2017, okay? But of course, naming tells us about the power, the power of people who have the ability to name, the power of people who give names, the power of people to take on certain names at will. Um, I also think that, that there's, and this tied as well to the quietness thing with, with the idea of sleeping. You spoke about sleeping, and you also spoke about Mary Sabande and this and this and this completely internal world that we have, and 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 on there I'd like to sort of you know uh, kind of because you guys are students and I get to sit with you, <laughs> um, that that uh, we need to put back black experience, that we need to introduce black experience. Black experience has always been there. Are you introducing yourself to it? Because it doesn't have to be introduced. Um, also. Uh, when, when Devin was talking and, and uh, she was talking about how uh, some of the, uh, the, the femme or the poet or woman 
how they might have thought about foreigners. I remember the Native Americans, or it's been recorded that they thought that uh, the new settlers to North America were, you know, stank really badly. They were like really disgusted with their body odor, for instance. Or the fact that when the German colonizers uh, uh, had to deal with Herrera society, that they actually say, say that any decision that they put forward to the society, the community leaders would then go back and discuss this with the women and how barbaric they thought of that was. I mean, why would they need to go and discuss, why would the men need to go and discuss this with the women? And now we're introducing democracy violently in many states. Mm -hmm. um, and just, just uh, uh, going back as well, some people, uh, some of the presenters, speaking about this tension always between op opacity and transparency, this cultural shorthand, uh, how do we get known? Uh, how do we make ourselves known? Should we make ourselves known? What are the dangers of being known all the time? And this kind of discomfort, that levels of discomfort is actually something that we should welcome. It's not, uh, you know, and, and, and lots of people, Bell Hooks, Judith Butler, speak about the dangers of having arrived rather than the process of becoming. Um, and, and I think also, you know, we, we are, we, our, our title of our conference is Re-Leading or Rethinking African Feminisms. And I think we've become very complacent about talking about double subjugation or triple subjugation. I mean, intersexual frameworks tell us that the, that the subjugations are almost endless. Mm -hmm. we, we can't just be speaking about a double or a triple oppression right now. We need to go beyond those because it's a hell of a lot more right now in this crazy Trump, Zuma, Putin, madness that we're all kind of enveloped in right now. So speaking around those subjects, I'd just like to open the dialogue uh, to the floor. <coughs> Hi, um, I, I'd like to read one question in from the first question. And it's kind of, it links up onto what you were talking about, Jolene. I wonder if thinking about this idea of white silence might be in, in, in this current kind of social justice conversation that we're having, if a naming of that kind of silence as a white silence is perhaps not um, a bit centralizing of, of whiteness back into the conversation, because I feel like white silence is, a, is, is much more of a choice than many other silences that are enforced on people. So, and, and I wonder if, if, if any kind of questions about breaking white silence might result in them, in, in, in whatever action taken thereafter being quite white savory in some way. So I was wondering if there's ways that we can think of, 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 of that specific thing, that discomfort and what results in that discomfort in ways that we cross the distance between, that we kind of bridge that distance between the self and the other that we constantly create um, in academia by thinking of ourselves precisely as intersectional. So um, for instance, the image of Sophie and yourself, um, white woman looking at a black woman as a domestic worker, is that that kind of distance that's been created by yourself and the, the, the other um, can't be crossed uh, by, or could be crossed by thinking of it in um in the it uh, being two women looking at one another, um, yeah. So I'm I'm trying to think of ways. Of, I'm asking your opinion on ways that we can begin to decentralize whiteness in this conversation about social justice, um, <coughs> and move away from ideas of like white silence and that that kind of centralizing that takes place when you name it. I don't know if I'm making sense. Um, thank you very much to the panelists, to, to um, Bev, Erin, and um, um, Amy. 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 Sorry, Amy. So, I, in the interest of um, Charlene's invitation and conversation, I'm going to throw some things at you. Not violently, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, imagine them as sort of not hard rocks being thrown at you, um, but something, I don't know. So, not too soft, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so three things. 
um, <laughs> Aaron. So I actually find your thinking around silence quite, and the relationship between silence and 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 whiteness and and white femininity and positionality and shifting quite interesting in light of because i mean i think that sitting in the south african context there's so much right now that we inherit right in terms of kind of thinking and rethinking in silence right so we have we have substantial bodies of work around feminist work around thinking and rethinking 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 silence um charlene's work which you 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 you, you, you are i'm sure very familiar with um some of yvette's work around around how do we even think about representing and and, and speculate her work around kind of what is a spec what is a what is a woman a speculative fiction like how do we talk about the silences without valorizing the silence or even something like college was the notion of a shouting silence right um or tabuse mutima's notion of the mute that always speaks right so we're sitting so right and 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 and, and, and okay so i'm starting with a variety of black women's um very differentiated attempts to kind of think about to think about think about how silencing um works but i mean we also can we sit with um a very f an equally kind of complicated um and sometimes more fraught um white woman's um history of trying to think about what a white silence that isn't passive might mean sometimes productive so whether we're talking about something like Marlene van Nieskerk, or we're talking about Anki Kroch, or we're talking about, you know, so there's, there's, so what I found fascinating about, 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 about kind of your exploration is this sense of thinking about a self-conscious um, silence that tries to think about guilt, not as a useless emotion in, in kind of the self-indulgent tradition that we often kind of see with kind of the hyper performance of kind of white white white, white silence right so i'm not going to respond i'm not going to say anything <laughs> um and, and this is a position of arrival right um and so i found your kind of um insistence on a kind of a fluctuating positionality <coughs> in relation to silence quite 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 productive but i want to push you a little bit um on on on, on that i, I want to push you on the on the on the on the on, on the productivity of that discomfort right so so what is a and I don't I mean I don't know that I want an answer but I just I I, I suppose as a as a as a as, as, as an as, as an exercise I'm interested in okay so what is it it seems to me quite productive right this 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 not just kind of as a self-consciously pacifying overwhelming oh god now I can't say anything mm -hmm. <laughs> right which 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 um so, so I, I, yes, I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying um, I, I want to push you on, on, on the discomfort, right, and on the self-reflexivity, not as a process that you then <coughs> that takes you somewhere else, but, 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 but perhaps stay with it, right? Um, um, and then, Bev, I don't know. Sorry, can I just do? I mean, I won't say anything yet. Um, <laughs> Bev, oh my God. Okay, so <sighs> what you were saying about what happens when the canvas is 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 is, is missing <coughs> got me thinking, and I, th I mean everything you were saying. Um, but 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 particularly how you're kind of positioned. Wh what does it mean? Maybe think about kind of notions about <sighs> the relationship between the canvas and the context, right? And 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 I and and and, and the relationship between a decolonizing African feminist, decolonizing African womanist, um, uh, investment, um, and the relationship of that to to context. Again, maybe think about kind of Yvette's work on speculative history. Um, so not so much what she's doing um, in that project to show kind of violence, but also what she's inviting us to think about in terms of kind of relationships to multiple histories and multiple epistemes 
um, as we produce this work that, 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 that tries to tries to think about sweeping knowledges, mm -hmm. tries to think about um, haunting um, <coughs> um, knowledges that, 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 that both seem obvious and ever present and, and difficult to write about as we try in academic <laughs> um, um, registers. So thank you very much for that. I don't really have a question, it's just, it's just those connections were, 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 were very important. And then finally, I'm, a, I'm finishing. Amy, um, I'm gonna be a little unfair <coughs> to you. Um, so, I wonder, I wanted to hear a little bit more about about the specific work that you were talking about. What do I mean? So, I mean, you gave us quite a lot about the context. You gave us quite a lot about what they make us think about, right? Um, I what I met, what I what I kind of am still yearning for having listened to you, and of course, I, I mean, a lot of this is because just because we only have so much time for today, and so <laughs> you want to get as much in and out of it as possible. So I understand that, um, but I wanted to know more about. I wanted to know more about um, about like talk us through more of Siwani's choices, right? For example, or 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 or, 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 or Jackson. It seemed to me that there was a, like you were, you, you were, your, your, your presentation was incredible on the, on the, on, uh, on the relationships between kind of the black body and, 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 and whiteness and, 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 and the clothing and unclothing and, 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 and so on. But it struck me, two things struck me. The first one was, these are all black women's bodies, right? So they're not just black bodies. And, and, and of course you name them as black women's bodies. But I, 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 I wanted more on, so for example, when, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the kind of relationship in, 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 in Siwani's work between, between it and Sanya's right? Which is a very gendered, um, in very specific ways, and, and, and w which, which I'm sure you, 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 you appreciate. But I, 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 yes, I was missing, and also even kind of Jackson's kind of, so much about lynching very often comes across comes to us as though it's a very specifically masculine <coughs> way of breaking black bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And so little about kind of um, kind of lynched black women's bodies, not just continentally, but across and, and, and the various and the various and the various and the various sort of meanings of that. But also, of course, Southern Africa has a very, Zimbabwe, for example, has a very specific um, history of lynching, which isn't quite the same. So what does it mean for, 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 for Jackson who travels so much between spaces where lynching is so important, but where it means slightly, the coloniality of black bodies hanging from trees means slightly differently in Southern Africa than it does that than it does in the US. It comes from very different kinds of context, but is, you know, I mean, obviously there's intersectionality, and, 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 and for Jackson to be an artist who, who moves so much between, between those spaces, um, and what it means that, you know, so, so I, wanted, I wanted a little bit more um, of that. And then you said something very interesting around um, language and languaging, mm. um, and 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 the refusal to translate, mm. um, and what that means, not just in terms of what we often assume. Well, not we. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we this we that we all disciplined into right as we get trained into disciplines right. Um, the we that is always assumed to not be a polyglot, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And what it means, what translating and not translating means in that in that in that instance. And you talked about it in terms of primacy, mm -hmm. um, and I and I wonder whether it isn't in fact important to question primacy, right? So when Bongwa <coughs> says I'm not going to translate, is she in fact privileged? And Tosa is already Tosa already privileged. Is, is she in a world in which Tosa is already privileged, right? So if I don't translate, if I see an khini and I don't translate Tosa, am I privileged in Tosa or do I live in a world where partly Tosa is already always a reference point, right? And so just the kind of thinking through what, what, what the various layers of translation means and creation and okay, I'm gonna stop talking now. Otherwise I just, thank you.
you saw me you find out in me <laughs> and thank you <laughs> three of you for incredibly provocative and, and pr incredible presentation Charlene and, and all these <laughs> other people. <laughs> and, and I'm fascinated by it. I mean, at one point, I actually want to take a year off and study myself as an academic icon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't never published a book. I haven't lectured in 20 years. My, my connection to universities at best has never more been 50%. And, I've, I, you know, since 2005, bar one, um, ill-starred experience at UWC, I've had nothing to do with academics. <laughs> and yet I continue to be cited, and it's people like you that continue to teach me, and I'm like, what's <laughs> up with these people, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but interestingly enough, the, the fact that, that uh, and it could be because nobody here is doing renewable energy and climate change. <laughs> I'm fascinated by the fact that the work that is being cited is from the 90s. <laughs> and I've actually written since. <laughs> Almost all bar one article which is available free online. So, so you know, Abrams, the academic icon, what is she? Is she an inflection of political correctness? Is she... You know, somebody I put there because I want to show that, because my supervisor says I must be there, or, or you know, do people actually read it? I, I don't know, but it's definitely worthy of a paper at, at some point. <laughs> so, so I'm going to shut up about that, except I wanted to point out that I'm a real person, and I'm <laughs> hating anybody's icon. No. Um, <laughs> um, um, Beverly, I've... Um, I want to say there's a personal, because my, my Khoisan ancestry is Zamara, right in the matriarchal line, and so, mm. so that's my ancestral land, that um, white lady. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just kind of sweet to see it in Grahamstown of all places. Mm. I think we need to maybe think about, are you writing about um, what white people have written about this mm. piece of art, which in itself mm. is a fascinating topic, and mm. yes, the story of them trying to prove that she's white is hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, always worth a good laugh and definitely a worthy topic. Or you're try trying to write about the art itself. And, and it may be that you're trying to do both, but I think you just need to sit back and think, which are you trying to do when? Because mm -hmm. they're two entirely different things. Um, you know, to view <coughs> Khoisan rock art as it's been inflected by white anthropologists is something, but it tells us nothing about the art. And so you just kind of need to figure what is it you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I want to warn you against the, the, the anthropological fallacy, um, about which I'm sure if you Google it, there's lots of, you know, the notion that because the Khoisan are doing something today that they <coughs> would have been doing it 10,000 years ago is, is, is just wrong. It, it, the chain of causation goes the other. I mean, they did something 10,000 years ago, they might still be doing it today. Yeah. But the modern Khoisan are as colonized as everybody else. So just because somebody does something out in the Kalahari Desert is not as an evidentiary um, persuasion saying that they did it at the time when the rock painting was done. So you just need to, to, to avoid that. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear your questions, and there's a lecture of mine on, on YouTube, if you Google the um, World, Mat World, World Matriarchy Conference of 2005, and I give an entire lecture on Khoisan Matriarchy, so that might help to answer the questions that you're asking. But what I'm saying is you cannot deduce an answer from modern day, as they couldn't from anybody else, right? It goes the other way around. Um, other than that, I mean, I'm loving your project and I'm wishing you lots of luck. Thank you. Um, exactly. So it's like it's a good point to mention all these things. Um, you're asking the right questions, and that's always important. Um, I'm having, and, and you must understand, this is for you too, how, how revolutionary it is for black feminists of my generation. I'm uh, just about to publish two articles on whiteness. And it made me so uncomfortable that I actually asked permission. I called Desiree and Louis Florence. Is it okay if I write about white people? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, Yvette, what is calling you to write about white people? I was like, oh, this, that, and the other. And she was 
like, no, okay, do it. <laughs> so I just want to say I have sanction for this. <laughs> It shows you like like the how discomforted because you know the the ideologically correct stance of course is to be a black feminist writing about blackness and so to uh, I, I devoted entire PhD thesis to writing about whiteness but since then actually put it aside and did grown up <laughs> things and so to come back to it in maturity I needed permission from 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 from, from Professor Lewis, uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, and one's going to be free online. The other one's most unfortunately in an academic publication, so you'll have to pay for it. But, but, but basically what I say is, and I'm going to approach this by way of anecdote, um, you know, Biko and Rampele started the white consciousness movement in 1972, and, and Rampele writes about it in, in her autobiography, and they did this quite deliberately. They said there has to be a place for conscious white people to sort themselves out. <laughs> and, and, and Biko even more sneakily citing Sabuku said, well, if you can split the enemy camp, then they'll do your work for you, and that will give us more time to focus on blackness, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so they did. They supported it financially, they supported it emotionally, they provided this space. The interesting thing was once they ceased to support it, I think it was somewhere around 1974 or 78, it collapsed. So maybe its time was not yet. Um, but, but I think their point is still valid today. I think there's a place for silence and there's a place to speak, but, but if you don't have a place to speak where whiteness is a non-reference, in other words, where you're all sitting with a bunch of white people together and so you can kind of exclude race, then it's going to be very <coughs> difficult for you to find an identity that allows you to speak in other public spaces. So maybe give a thought to that, and of course Rampella's autobiography I think speaks a lot more about it, but give a space to where are the places and spaces in which we explore different things, and that will help you um, mm -hmm. identify. Okay, so now I too shall shut up. Thank you. <laughs> 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 um, I want to thank all the three presenters. I find it very fascinating as a person who doesn't produce any art, but is a avid consumer, especially of, of movies. So um, I have seen the, the, the public uh, images of Sophie, but I'm wondering if everyone in the audience has, because it really is very powerful, and if we could project it, it would be wonderful. I'm sure it's easy to find, but I'm not insisting you do it <coughs> right now. <coughs> but I'm thinking really about the story we heard from Erin was a kind of self-reflection. And uh, I think she managed to capture for me the, the kind of paralysis of guilt that a lot of white people must feel. <coughs> and what do you do with that? And I think that white people are in a situation now where they're damned if they speak and they're damned if they don't. It's something like that that I am I'm trying to put myself in that place. I, I would expect that in the face of the, of the most ruthless oppression of, of black and colored people, in the spaces which are mixed, maybe white people feel they've got nothing to say, but I'm wondering about what happens when white people are together, mm -hmm. because we have no <laughs> access to that space. So, is there silence in those spaces of people who are self-reflective and aware and who may have just woken up to this? What happens there? Are white people prepared to disturb their place at the dinner table when they're surrounded by other white people? I really would like to hear about that uh, because it's very difficult to disrupt your own culture. And I'm sure black people feel it too in very traditional black settings. And Indians feel it in very traditional Indian settings. So that's, that's one question. Mm. <laughs> the second is about the, the portrayal of maids. I'm putting that in inverted commas, domestic workers. Now the, the, the mammy that you talk about, you see in, uh, I, I just remember films like um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and uh, not one flew over the cuckoo's nest. What is that? 
about the bird in the book. The to kill a mockingbird, to kill a mockingbird, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then uh, um, the, the film that was called The Maid, in which you get a very different picture of a maid who shows a lot of agency and finds very subtle ways of, you know, taking her back on, on her own back on the white uh, mistresses. So you, you have very different images of domestic workers. And I wonder how much both black and white people reflect on the relationship they have with their own domestic workers and how much of it is, is colored by um, understanding of, of domestic workers as humans a realization that came very late to Erin after she saw the, the Kibanda's painting. <coughs> so I'm interested in knowing how black middle class women treat <coughs> black domestic workers. How do Indian women treat black domestic workers? Mm. Is it all the same? It seems to me very often that we are in a space where <coughs> we are so so like um, tentative about our meanings. You know, it's like you can't put your finger on anything. So the moment you say one thing, you have to also immediately in a way be able to say the opposite of that. And then you have to be say the opposite of that from another point of view. So looking at the painting where, I've forgotten the name of the, uh, of the artist, where she dresses as a man and surrounded by black, I think that was in Jackson. Amy's presentation. Jackson. Yeah, Jackson, black um, naked women. Now that reminded me so <laughs> much of, um, of a Western painting, which is a picnic, I think, or a garden. Is it Mane or someone like that? Where the men are all dressed, there are many men, they're all dressed and the woman is naked and available. So, you know, there are so many connections and resonances and I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> if, if our educating ourselves and knowledge making really is about not limiting yourself to one understanding, but also saying that and immediately being able to say the next thing. <coughs> and so we are always like open-ended and we're always in a situation where we will never know, mm -hmm. we will never be able to fix anything because of the transience of our understandings. Mm. So I just wanted to make those points. I don't know. Okay. Mm. I think one last comment from from you, Mitra. This is a little too black to be presented. If if you feel so, want to take that one before we close it out. Yeah. Okay. First, um, Beverly, um, Amy, and Erin, thank you so much for these presentations that exhibit the very things that we're here to um, do is basically to um, discuss our physical, psychological, emotional reactions and place ourselves within within the theories um, theorization of, of external things and how those externals and the internals um, collide often without us exploring them. Um, his historical things, colonial things, our personal practices, everyday, I mean, our employment practices essentially as well. Uh, and the ways of looking at things we call art and how, how they too express ways of um, exploiting um, the gaze in many ways. So um, I'm really grateful for these presentations. I was thinking about the fact that often we don't interrogate um, positionality and I think those, those are the ways in which <coughs> we've inherited, um, you know, essentially Western canonical ways of thinking is to not interrogate what does it mean for me to have come from this, these politics and being positioned in these ways and how does it affect the ways I look at this person, um, performative art or my um, domestic worker, and which even um, in changing the phrase that we use, um, be it the maid or the domestic worker, they're both ways of eliding the relationship we continue to have with the person who works for us for a very tiny amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like calling it a domestic worker almost rankles me so much because it makes it sound um, like we now have a, um, you know, nice new age relationship with her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we don't, economically not much has changed. Mm -hmm. So actually I think a friend of, two of my friends, uh, people, two academics I know, 
um, have a um, book out called Friendship in South Africa, John Soster and um, Shannon Walsh. And so I wrote about a chapter on the ways in which artists in South Africa have been um, really, really engaged with their idea of what does it mean to have this relationship with the person who works in your home um, that you are completely dependent on in many ways, that your academic careers, your um, subjectivity as um, a privileged person of whatever um, racial background you have, uh, is made by the person who is taking care of your children. Mm -hmm. um, everybody from you know um, Ernest Cole to Omar Baja to George Hallett, um, and I'm talking photographers, right? Mm -hmm. And Mary Sibande, of course, and many, many artists have, and painters have explored that relationship. And um, what does this mean? Because obviously it, it is such a blight on our, you know, that silence is there. And it is a guilty silence too, of which we cannot speak. Often, you know, guilt and silence are together mm -hmm. because um, like Pumla said, like we think guilt is the stopping point. Like I feel guilty, I'm so sorry. <laughs> done, <laughs> finished then, you know, it's done. But it's not an action. It's often a, a storing ground for inaction. So how to do that productively? <laughs> Or, or with erasure of, uh, or, or discourses that um, cover um, people's ownership of their art. Um, what do you do to reclaim that ownership? And um, can that um, can the performance artist that um, you're speaking about um, claim a space with their bodies and performative um, bodies that um, use nudity and the shock of nudity? Um, without being objectified, because that object objectification is always going to be there. Mm. I mean, even um, Butoye talks about that, because she says, how do I do this now? Um, but yet I'm naked and black and, uh, you know, obviously very, very beautiful, attractive young woman. And then um, saying, okay, how do I now create that without, but it doesn't ever happen without, it's always an accompaniment. And, and until we can say it's still these complicated ways of um, seeing it are still present. Not that, not that I can avert my eyes or, or rid myself of those ways of reading. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And there's no way we can do it without acknowledging that. If you acknowledge that, the silence begins to diminish. And then you have a, a way of um, speaking about it with um, acknowledging it, which begins a far more fruitful dis dialogue with responsibility, which I think is you know, far more productive, but it, it is a hard place to be. And race is not the only way of subjugating the other because we come from places that have ethnicity, <laughs> sh uh, skin shade, inherited titles, all of those things that um, you know, like the, the country where my parents come from, which is Sri Lanka, they <coughs> don't care about race. It's all about like your name and what class you came from and the ethnic group you come from. And they'll identify you according to your clan name and that's all that, it's not about race. So race isn't the only way of doing it. So we all ca carry multiple ways of um, privileging ourselves and denigrating the other. So um, we all have to kind of discuss how we're going to see these layers whilst acknowledging it. Yeah. there's this kind of aggressive silence. We know it when you have a student in mm -hmm. class who's not silent because they're feeling guilty. They're not silent because they're feeling discomfort. They're silent because they're withholding participation. Mm -hmm. it's, I, it's like, I have to be here and I have to get through this course, but n in no way am I actually going to engage you. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm going to leave this class. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get my degree and I don't need to give a shit about what you're mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. That withholding, so the non-performativity mm -hmm. that becomes a site of aggression. Um, as I think also, you know, that this work on silence needs just to be so much more nuanced mm. uh, about what silence does and what silencing is. Um, and then learning to dialogue, right? It's so important. 
uh, I, I'm very wary of the of, of kind of debates where it says you have no right to speak. Well, everybody has the right to speak and everybody has the right to be heard. But certainly groups of people have to learn how to talk mm -hmm. to others. They need to relearn how to dialogue and to not hold the conversation about themselves mm -hmm. where almost everything then goes into a me uh, and minus and uh, how that is a distinction where black, uh, uh, where race discourse and feminist discourse situates positionality as a form of authorizing knowledges mm -hmm. that have been subjugated as opposed to resituating that 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 site of of uh, he, 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 hegemony that's that's in our cultures um so so i think it's it is important i think we always we always need because i think this is with south africa right we need to learn to talk we need to learn how to speak to each other and we need to learn how to engage mm -hmm. and and yvette i'm sorry but there's just no date on <laughs> on knowledge in which we find ourselves <laughs> <laughs> no uh, you you we're gonna we're gonna be using that '90s article for a long time to come. Okay, I'm gonna give I'm we're just gonna give a few minutes for our p uh, participants to respond if you feel like it. <laughs> Any of you feel like saying anything? So <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah, I just um wanted to kind of respond back on the line. Um, when you said like what happens in those white spaces in the um, white people speaking to each other, um, all of this work and my like my visual art practice as well as dealing with like it's so easy to disrupt those spaces. Just mm. bringing up something that's slightly taboo. Mm. Those spaces mm. are so fragile. Like mm. um, all of this, um, mm. yeah. Just the way that I've been interrogating this space, navigating this space, um, has been like birthed out of that being a killjoy in those spaces you mm. know because i think um when you're learning you're coming into feminism for me it was difficult i was just like where do i start <coughs> here like and like I, you know being um yeah quite like stuck sometimes and um yeah so sarah ahmed's paper where it's like about being a killjoy and i was like yeah well this is where i fit you know um and yeah so that's what i i, I started doing like from <coughs> young like disrupting those spaces um and what i've always like hoped is that like by disrupting those spaces by making a scene like ruining the dinner table having my uncles like <laughs> feed me oh god <laughs> <laughs> so many times <laughs> i hope that it causes one of them or a, like a few that are sitting there to to change you know to change their thinking but um yeah i've, I've like you learn like very quickly that a lot of people um, you can't change their thinking and th that's like yeah it's very difficult especially like those students ones that they like that uh, aggressive silence mm -hmm. you, you can't control the way people think mm -hmm. you know um, but yeah so I guess but all of this need to align on this yeah <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah so I think more than anything um like why I chose to like write the paper in like a sort of like to discursivize the paper to show how I'm like I'm still like yeah I, I don't really know which way I'm going I'm still grappling with it I'm all hoping to like spark a dialogue between others you know open the space because like I'm not done this is just the beginning and it's exciting you know and like um, the yeah the performance piece I'll do tonight as well deals with similar things to like literally disrupting the table so like it's yeah it's I, I hope that when you disrupt these spaces when you create unhappiness or you create discomfort or supposedly create discomfort um, sparks people to question that maybe um, am I creating discomfort or am I exposing the discomfort that's already there mm -hmm. you know um, yeah um, I agree Disrupting the white space, but I also tried to do the same whenever I get something uh, I'm going to be quiet about it. And I think that is a space where we can actively choose to not be silent in a way that's the most productive um, in these white spaces. Um, then, in terms of the language thing that you asked me about, Tamar, I think that um, these art spaces are still in the process of changing. There is still English is still the primary language, and I think the way that we change that is from artists like Mbonga and Kiwani challenging that and using their own languages mm. to 
like um for example in Mbonga's performance the audience was I would say mostly English speaking so a lot of us w- were not understanding what was being said but it was still such a <laughs> passionate performance and I think it's really important to 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 do that because it's just English isn't forced on people so often, so it sh- it, that should change. I, I think that it needs to be shifted, and it's, that's why I think that the titling in that way is very important. I can do five for all your comments, and yeah, I tried to say that you do do, and you too. You too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's part of aligning to what we study, mm-hmm. art history and visual culture. So I uh, visual, so I am doing a bit of a mixture. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you see Mary Kibanda? Uh, can you put up an image while we while we while we ending? Uh, just a reminder as well about what uh, people like Bell Hooks tell us that uh, coming to personal revelation is not an end in itself. It is not tied to wider activism mm-hmm. and us changing society. Being brilliant and knowledgeable and critical by yourself doesn't really change all that much. Mm-hmm. So um, it's great that when we come to that, but we need to shift it beyond that. 